All right, so um, here's how this will work. I'm going to I'm going to talk, lecture a little bit. Um, I'm going to it's going to I'm going to guide the conversation based on the slideshow that you'll see on the screen. Hi, Mark. Um, but please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. It always works better for me if questions are being asked because then I can reach in the knowledge that maybe that I haven't um, planned to talk about but uh, have information about. There's a lot more information now than there was last week, so um, we may put some of that stuff in. I particularly want to talk about, um, at some point, about what's going around the internet, about breathing exercises that some of the doctors are um, recommending. I don't want to speak to some of those and my thoughts about some of them. Not that I'm going to pick them, but maybe make them a little bit more um, effective. Okay, so um, I'm Robert. And the purpose is I'm a breathing teacher. I've been a breathing teacher for 32 years. I teach the Bateco breathing method. I'm a continuum movement teacher. I'm a body worker. And so the purpose of this presentation is to provide the information that I know as a breathing teacher um, and how you can use your own breath for more resilience, for boosting your immune system, for um, keeping your lungs working, getting yourself oxygenated, and all the ways that I know how to do that through both my movement practice and through my Bateco practice. So I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not giving you medical advice. I need to say that. But I am a certified breathing uh, behavior analyst. So I analyze people's behavior because breathing is a behavior and a habit. So the goal today is to keep ourselves and our lungs as safe as possible with breathing skills and breath awareness that nourish and not dissipate. So for me, some of the things that have really helped me contextualize why I study breathing is because it is an ally. It is my friend. It helps me understand my, my inner landscape. I really appreciate that um, nature has its own, breathing has its own nature and I wanna be connected to the nature of breathing because I am a nature myself. And then we learn about our breathing through our behaviors and we're gonna study a little bit about breathing behavior today. And so breathing supports self-regulation of all body functions. So for me, breathing is a sacred gift. There are no two breaths alike. It's always different. And so I like to look at breath as a sacred gift and honor it and treat it with tenderness and grace and be in partnership with it. In times of isolation for me, when I'm feeling really, you know, sort of out of it or not connected, I can go to my breathing, feel the connection I feel through my own breathing, being touched from the inside out as a way of make, making myself feel intimate and intimate with the process of breathing and intimate the process of myself. And breath connects us all. Everybody is breathing the same atmosphere. We all share the same air. And so we are connected through breath, through everyone. So this issue of the virus it is a global pandemic, and it is the way we are all concerned about one thing and one thing only, with the air and how we, our health and our breathing. So I wanted to start off with this particular breathing awareness because I noticed that um, I, I want to practice it at the beginning of my teaching. And so one of the things that we're going to talk about a little later is that every time we use our mouth for breathing, we trigger our autonomic nervous system to create a little bit of uh, mobilization and sort of fight and flight. So one of the mandates of, of Bateco and of breathing is to pace yourself so you can breathe through your nose almost all the time. So that includes when I'm speaking. When I'm speaking, I am certainly exhaling while I'm using words. If I pace myself, there comes a point in my conversation where I feel like I don't have enough breath to power my language. So I close my mouth and I take a breath back through my nose. And it's not a quick breath. It's not one that I'm grabbing for. It's one that's allowing the air to flow back in. I feel the connection to my own breathing, I feel the movement of my body. And I know that I'm completed the breath and I'm ready for the next one. So my, all <coughs> my activity and my speaking is geared towards the pacing of my breathing. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to lay it in really right in the beginning so that I practice it as well. So those of you who are not muted, can you mute your phones, your speakers, your microphones, so that there's no back. Um, 
So Pat, if you can admin. I'm working on it. <clears throat> I'll mute this one here. Okay. Pat, I can do that for you too. Okay. So just take that into, into consideration for yourself. It's a, it's a way of practicing your own breathing and being staying connected to yourself and not overrunning yourself and not overworking and not getting yourself out of breath and not grabbing for breath through your mouth. We'll talk more about that. So I have two screens, so I'm looking back and forth. I'm not losing you. So we're going to do a breathing exploration right off the beginning, right off the start here. So this, you know, when people ask, say, well, um, I'd say a breathing exercise and people say, well, every time I do a breathing exercise, I get really crazy around it and I don't breathe well. Usually it's because people say right away, am I breathing right or wrong? There's always a kind of a judgment about breathing and whether or not I'm doing it right or whether I'm doing it wrong. How am I supposed to be doing it? And as soon as a judgment comes in or an opinion about your own breathing, breathing tightens up. So the simplest way that I understand slowing the breath down, which is a priority to not be over breathing, to keep the breath at about 12 breaths per minute. And to also feel the satisfaction of breathing and to be equalizing the breaths in and out is to just follow movement. There's two very important movements that are happening when we breathe. One is the movement of air. And the other is the movement of our body in relationship to the change of pressure that air creates when we breathe in and when we breathe out. So just following movement, not being, evaluating the movement, being curious to sense the movement of the body and breath in relationship to each other and put our awareness into the fact that we're moving internally as a result of breathing. So let's just take three minutes for all of us to do that and see what happens. All right, I'm gonna start the watch. So remember, just pay attention to movement as you breathe through your nose. Close your eyes if you like, or leave them open. And it's your choice to do this or not. You may notice tension levels changing. On the exhale, you may notice some release of tension. And if you do, just notice your next inhale and if it feels easier or more spacious. Using your nose for inhaling and exhaling.
All right, letting that come to a close. And letting your eyes drift open slowly. So just taking a quick moment, how was that for you? Did you feel yourself slowing down? You can either speak or you can just nod your head. This is a real easy way to just engage with your own breath. It's just follow movement. Because all there's always movement internally. Well, as long as we're alive, we're going to feel movement internally. So following breath in and feeling the movement and feeling that relationship is the easiest way for turning into our internal environment. Which I, which I feel. Go ahead, Santa. Yeah, please. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I noticed um, anxiousness when I inhale. Like, whoop. Go ahead. Yeah, oh. just anxiousness on the inhale in my um, shoulder, chest area. And when you exhale, are you able to let some of that anxiousness or those feelings in your chest sort of move down towards the earth a little bit? It would take more time. But... It would take more time. Okay, well, we're going to place with some more of those exercises, but it's good to notice that. So you're feeling some anxiety. Okay. And it's really good to notice that. It's good to notice where we're holding that, uh, that anxiousness so that we can work with that a little bit. And so we're going to do a breath piece in a little in a little while it may help some of that we'll come check back in with you okay so I hadn't shared the screen before but now you see the screen right okay so susceptibility susceptibility has been really an interesting thing for me to uh, take a look at and for us to read about in the paper and what we're seeing now of course is that the people who are most susceptible yes have um, compromised immune systems and compromised lung systems um, and respiratory systems and cardiovascular systems. And statistics are coming out more and more that show that those places where the air pollution was highest are the places where the people are most susceptible. And in the earlier um, statistics about older people being more susceptible, in my opinion, and now it's being validated by some other writings, is that the older people, myself included, have been breathing unclean air for the longest amount of time. So our lungs have been the most damaged. And as a result, we have lost some of our breathing capacity as a result. And so we have to take that into consideration. Now, of course, more young people are dying as well, but it is the highest rate of disease and infection from the virus comes into the from the most polluted places on the on the planet, which where Wuhan was. Wuhan was one of the, the most polluted cities in the world, and so articles are coming out to speak to um, that. It, you know, if you're suffering from air pollution, then you are more susceptible. So, it's important to note um, that it's harder to fight off infections, and it worsens worsens our reactions. So nothing we can do about it if we've lived in cities where the air pollution has been really high, like I have. I grew up in New York City and breathed that air for a lot of years. Um, so this is also an important thing to note that 91%, actually I read a statistic today that said 95% of the world's population does not have clean air to breathe. That's an outstanding statistic that only 5% of the population has clean air to breathe. So everybody is compromised at this particular moment. Also, what's really worth noting is that it's not just the respiratory system that gets um, in trouble, it's the heart that gets in trouble more. 72% of the people who die from air pollution die from heart attack and stroke, and only 18% from lung complications. And the figure is up in just two years from 7 million people die premature death to nine, close, close to nine million people die every year from air pollution. And that's only the people we know about. We don't know about the people who didn't get diagnosed that way. We don't know about the people who didn't come into, into the ER for, for that result. So um, that's an outstanding statistic. It's a pandemic every year. It's a pandemic. Air pollution is a pandemic. And the World Health Organization considers air to be cancer causing. And so, you know, whether we're aware of it or not, for me, um, at the level of our nervous system, our nervous system is aware of the fact that air is not healthy to breathe these days. And that's an incredible lack of trust, which upsets our nervous system. 
Um, one of the interesting statistics that gets reported um, is that there are less heart attacks coming into the hospital and the doctors are wondering where all the heart attack patients have gone. Well, in most of those cities, the air is now clean because it only takes between 24 and 48 hours to be breathing really dirty air for the heart to be affected. So without the air pollution, we're seeing less heart attacks, a byproduct. So this is what China looked like if you hadn't seen this picture image before. On the left was China with the air pollution, the gray, the orange rather. And this is what it looked like a couple of a month after the virus hit in China. The air pollution was gone completely, except in Beijing, a little bit left in Beijing. Pretty outstanding. This is also really outstanding that's getting reported. I think it's worth noting that India, for the first time in 30 years, people in India can see the Himalaya mountains. Haven't been able to see them in over 30 years. Pretty amazing. So there's an upside to this, that the virus is being very intelligent, I think, and showing us that this can be cleaned up pretty quickly. All right, so nose breathing is essential, and there are three important things to really remember here. You breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose. It's a, really, it's a little quip, but it's an important thing to remember. So nose breathing is where it's at, mouth breathing is not. We talk about air pollution. When you breathe through your mouth, you take the air pollution right into your lungs immediately. You pace your activity level so you can breathe through your nose all the time. And it's especially important when you're outside now. Every, most everybody's wearing masks, but it's even under the mask you want to be nose breathing. Why? Because the nose filters, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So people talk about exercising. Well, what happens when I exercise? So here's two examples of two people who exercise with their mouths closed. One is Sonia Richards Roth on the left, picking up a gold medal after running a quarter mile completely nose breathing. She's practiced what I'm teaching here today. Look at the beautiful ease in her body, can be done. And there's the swimmer on the right, breathing through his nose while he's swimming. Much more difficult to do, but can be done. So no excuses, it just takes some practice. So a port of, so in breathing and learning how to breathe properly, or actually in you know maximizing your efficiency to be able to breathe well at a certain time, and see if this works for you, Senta is a help uh, a good posture so in Bateco we we have people doing the horse rider position and the horse rider position is this little girl on the left who's sitting on the edge of her chair she's sitting mostly on her sit bones you can see that her thighs really are not on the chair itself and her feet are flat on the floor in the horse rider position imagine you had a horse underneath you and so you would be having your legs spread a little wider than shoulder width apart so that gives you three solid bases of support, the bottoms of your feet and your bottom. And that's a duplication of how each vertebrae in the spine touches each other. They touch with two points in the front on feet of the vertebrae and the body of the vertebrae. So it's really aligning our spine, which keeps our lungs from being crushed by our stomach in another position and the diaphragm free to move. On the right side of your picture is somebody lying down and they have their knees up. That's what's worth noticing there. When you lie flat on your back, you lose 40% of your lung function because your stomach and your liver move up towards your diaphragm and inhibit its movement. When you put your knees up, then the diaphragm has more room because the viscera of the belly move towards the pelvis, freeing up the diaphragm to move more easily. So if you're gonna lie on your back at any time, put your knees over a pillow, and you really don't wanna be sleeping on your back you lose that lung function and you draw to drop back and occlude the airway. So sleeping on your left side is a better position or your right side. And some doctors are now on the internet are talking about sleeping on your stomach or resting on your stomach. The function of resting on your stomach, if you can, is that your lungs are compressed against the bed and it limits overbreathing. It keeps your breathing at a level that's appropriate for the lungs. Okay. Here's another piece that's really important, and we're going to try this together. The tongue needs to be at the roof of the mouth, almost at all times. And the teeth are slightly touching or close together, and your lips are lightly sealed. And why this is true is this is what happens here. This is picture here shows an airway, the drawing of an airway that's open. You know, you can see maybe a quarter of an inch there, or opening there. And, this, and you can see the roof of the mouth here, which is the bottom the floor of the nose. And the tongue is resting right up against 
the roof of their mouth, all the way to the back. Not easy for those of us who haven't done it for most of our lives, but uh, you can practice it. And here is what it looks like when the tongue is not all the way up to the roof of the mouth, bottom of the nose, the airway gets smaller, much smaller. So we want to go and practice this just for a minute. So just taking that. So here's a way to feel whether your tongue is at the back of the teeth back there is to say the syllable ack, A-C-K, ack, ack, and feel how that tongue lifts up towards the back, ack. So just see if you can let your tongue rest. If you know you have all have ridges back there, um, right behind your teeth is a, a series of ridges behind your teeth. You want to have that tongue, tip of the tongue, up at that first ridge, not exactly behind the teeth, but up at that first ridge. And so just close your mouth, put that tongue up there, and just notice your breathing. Just notice the ease, effort, and then drop the tongue down and notice what happens to the, to the flow of air. Does it feel as efficient or does it feel as open uh, when it's down? Thank you, Mark. Or better when it's up. And also there's a note here that says, thank you, Suzanne, also says it completes the respiratory circuit. So just also feel that. I know from my internal sense, when my tongue is up there, I feel like my whole torso is connected in the breathing movement. When I drop my tongue down, I don't feel that continuous flow, that full connection. In Taoist practice, it talks about the microcosmic orbit, the orbit of the body circulating between the sky and earth. And the tongue is the marriage for that. So I feel much more centered myself when my tongue is at the roof of the mouth and a little less connected when it's down lower. Can I say yeah. something, Robert? Please, Mark. Um, in uh, Tai Chi practice, which I've been doing for quite some time, we're also taught to have the tongue touch, touching the roof of the mouth. In mm -hmm. tai um, and probably in Qigong as well, I imagine. But um, so it's, it seems to be an ancient understanding. It yeah. totally is. I have a link at the back of this slide presentation, which you all get from a, key, a Qigong master. And that's one of the first things he talks about, where to place the tongue. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and I like the mechanicalness of it, of showing the fact that the airway changes, uh, changes shape. So, it's really what, quite, do, quite quite dramatic change when I when you said it. I you, we just take it for granted. I never never thought of how it changes the flow so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Spenta, I'm curious for you where your tongue is generally. Um, I don't. Truthfully, I don't uh, put a lot of emphasis on it. And I was going to ask you. Uh, you don't mean to curl curl the tongue. You just mean to to. Um, position it but not to curl it right curling i'm not quite sure but look at this center look at this image here see this is the this is the tongue right here a little behind a little um above the teeth of course behind the front teeth and see how it's curled here all the way to the back so it's not just pointing the tip of it but it's actually curled the pink is the tongue see? oh the pink is the tongue oh, yeah, okay. see how it's curled right here so that's the way it's meant to lie in there. It's, it's really a difficult thing for adults to do when they haven't done it all their lives because as children, when children are developing and if they learn to practice putting their tongue up there and leaving it there, it spreads the palate and it keeps the teeth in the face wide. So there's room for the tongue. If you haven't done it most of your life, then there really isn't going to be room for the tongue up there. So we can do the best we can by trying to at least lay it up as much in a curl as we can with the tip of the tongue touching that those those ridges back there so that so my curiosity for you senta is that when you take the inhale and your tongue is in that right place if you feel a little bit less anxiety on the inhale yeah i uh am bre i breathe deeper i sort of bypass the chest a little bit where yeah. you know yeah and the, the, yeah yeah, because when you bypass the chest, anxiety lives in the chest. It lives right. In a smaller space and a faster movement up in the chest. So great. There's a piece right there for you. Great. Great. Okay, so I just want to show this picture for people who never have seen the size of the lungs. 
the size of this person's arms are raised like this, but even so, the lungs are here above the clavicles. The top of the lungs are above the clavicles. They come almost to the neck. And if you follow your rib basket all the way down to you feel the last rib in the front, that's where they are in the front. And if you follow your ribs back to your back, you'll feel the slant happening is what you see here. So there's more room and more space in your lungs in the back of your body than there is in the front of your body. So it's especially important for people who are having difficulty breathing to be looking for the air more in the back of their body than in the front of their body. Because if they look in the front, there's less space and you tend to pull up. When you're breathing in the back, you're actually letting the back expand open in the back and downward, which is more air back there. It's very important when we're short of breath to see where is the air itself. And here are the airways. This is a real human live body pictured alive. And we can see the airways here, which look, look a little less um, dead tree branch like than we normally see in images of the lungs. They're very alive, they're very movable, they're very flexible, and they wave inside the lungs. So it's important to know that it's a live, living dynamic inside of our lungs that's moving air around to support our lives. So we're gonna do another breathing exercise. So I'm gonna tune you into um, this image here of another human body here, live. And this is the picture of the nose without the vestibule, just right here at this level of the bones. <clears throat> these, these bones that we see here are called turbinates. And this is the inferior turbinate the middle turbinate and the upper turbinates. And what, these air, what, this air, what this does is it circulates the air in our body. It makes it move around in a way that picks up the moisture and the heat and dumps heat if we want. So some of you know the, the, um, the value of alternate nostril breathing from yoga where you, know, you alternate nostril breathe. And the reason yoga does that is because they have discovered over the years, three, 5,000 of them, that when we breathe in through our right nostril, we tune the electricity of our left hemisphere the brain, in the brain. And when we breathe through our right nostril, we're tuning the electricity in the right side of our brain, the right hemisphere. So alternate nostril breathing in that particular time helps the body tune both evenly and we feel a little bit more balanced that way. Most people notice that one nostril is more stuffed than the other generally at certain times. That's because the, we breathe dominantly in one side and it switches every 20 to 90 minutes. So sometimes we're breathing through the right and so we're working with this electricity and sometimes we're breathing through the left and we're working here. So when people feel like they're stuffed, they may not always be as stuffed as they think they are, they're just using a different um, nostril at a particular time. The other piece that I really like about this is that each one of these openings that's defined by the bone has another part of relationship to our brain. The lower one relates more to the brain stem or our instinctual response to things. The middle opening relates more to the limbic system, which is our emotional body and our heart. And the upper hole relates more to bliss and our cognitive our thinking brain. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Shana. So um, I got this also, and I've been practicing for years, giving this one away. I got this. This is 5,000 years old as well. And this is about how to, how to turn the breathing, your breathing, over to your lungs and out of your will. So most of us, when we breathe, put some effort into it. We try to draw air in. So I want you to feel your normal way of breathing, whether you're efforting to breathe in and whether you're efforting to breathe out. Breathing out is meant to be passive with no sound. So you're just getting a baseline on your pattern and your habit of how you breathe air in and out. And then you want to think the syllable sa. So when we think something, we hear it. It's like we're saying it, but you're not doing it verbally or audibly. You're thinking sa. And you're thinking ha on the way out. So you want to see a little bit about how much effort you use for breathing when you say sa ha compared to your own pattern. You want to feel the flow of air. And you want to see too 
how much more, my experience, my body opens to receive the air. In my normal breathing pattern, when I pull air in, I'm working. So therefore, I feel like my chest is tightening, even though I'm trying to put air in there. But when I say saw, my whole body just opens because the lungs are actually now in charge of pulling air through my nose and they know exactly how much they need and want. And so we're not saying it aloud, Sandra. It's just thinking. It, that's okay. And I'll mute you. Okay. It's just, thank you. Good to get the correction in there. So it's just thinking the word. This is a really valuable exercise in getting more space to breathe into. And letting the lungs decide if you need more or less at a particular moment based on your relaxation level at the time. Remember the exhale is passive. It's letting the lungs do their elastic thing. Pushing the air out, diaphragm pushing up. Don't need, doesn't need any of your energy. And the important thing here too is when you finish your exhale, when you think you finish your exhale, you know you finished your exhale when there's an, a natural reflex in the body that says time for an inhale. So you're waiting for that reflex. It takes some practice, but usually means your exhale is going longer than you normally think it is or will go. Remember the tongue is at the roof of the mouth. See if it doesn't invite a little more relaxation in your stomach area. So this is a real simple, quiet exercise, exploration to find more air, especially in the back. The breath follows awareness. So just think about your back body and notice its movement. All right, how's that working for you? So all of these things that I'm offering today are just beginnings that you can play with and practice for periods of time to get used to it. Because after a while, you don't need to say sa and ha, you just learn to breathe this way. Could stay here for a long time. Any comments? Any noticings worth it's worth mentioning here? Is the sa and ha are they shorter breaths, or am I find myself being longer breaths? Is that they are longer breaths? I want to thanks for the question, Mark. They they are longer breaths, but you probably also notice that the amount of air you that's moving through you is smaller. It's not like a large quantity. It's a smaller volume. But my diaphragm is getting bigger. It seems like I've got to have more oxygen in my diaphragm. And, but you're saying I'm getting less oxygen? Or there's oh, less no. air travel? We'll get to this, but you're always having, unless you have something long like COVID, you're always got enough oxygen. Uh, so, but it's what it's doing. It's putting the lungs in charge. So if you've been shallow breathing or holding your breath for a while, let's say, 
and you start this activity, your body's going, whoa, there's more room to breathe. There's more space to breathe in. So we'll use that now to make up what we haven't been getting before in terms of volume. But it slows, absolutely slows the breath down. So moving from um, Western medicine says that 18 breaths per minute is normal. In my Bateco practice, it's 12 breaths per, uh, per minute is normal. In yoga, it's four to six. And in the, in the new discoveries of resonant frequency breathing, which means your heart and your breath are moving sim simultaneously in coherence with each other, it's four and a half breaths to seven breaths per minute. So when we do the saha, my noticing is I get down to that four and five breaths per minute. But the amount of air per breath is less. So I'm getting more air, but in a slower way with less volume and less pressure on the lungs to work harder to you know deal with large volumes of air and and more diaphragmatic movement great center was that easier on your inhale great claudia i need to mute you need to unmute still muted hold on hold on still muted Now, does the fact to think about uh, breath in the back, doing that help to learn to go there? Yeah, well, the simplest, I mean, the simplest thing is one of the fascinating things about breathing is breath follows awareness. So if you think about your back body and then you turn into not anything other than do I feel movement there now? And if I feel movement there, then that's where breath is. But if a part of us comes unconscious, it doesn't receive the nourishment of the movement of breath at a conscious level. And we want to feel that nourishment at a conscious level because really breathing, when we're not struggling, can be a pleasurable experience or should be a pleasurable experience. So feeling the back widen and the ribs lift is a good place to be looking for air. I've talked to a few people who have had the virus and that's been useful for them to move, to look for air in the back of the body because the front feels so compressed and so pushed down. So that goes, that's true for anything. Anytime we want to feel like, when this is not the point of this talk today, but if let's say I had a pain in my shoulder and I said, well, let me put my shoulder in my awareness and then breathe with the awareness of my shoulder and the pain. I'll feel movement there. And I'll feel movement there that's being initiated by my own breathing body and not my will to try to make my shoulder move. But it shows me movement at a fluid level because breath is a wave and fluid that reminds me that there's possibility of movement there. So breath follows awareness. Thanks, Claudia. Does that answer the question? You can mute yourself again. Anybody else have a comment? Sabine. Hold on. Yeah, I just noticed um, how it dissolves the sense of inner outer and brings us into or brings me into a sense of continuity. Mm -hmm. Continuity and coherence. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, the other the other C that I like is connection. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm now connect to the process, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Great. No, we're on a call. Okay, so keep this in mind. Remember, you're going to get these slides, so you'll be able to come back and refer to them, and you'll also get the recording. So if there's anything here that needs to be repeated, you can look it over it again. All right, so we want to stay calm and maintain nourishing breathing habits. What we just did, a couple of things we just did are part of that process. So let's just track a little bit so we really understand the difference between what happens at the body, at the nervous system level, at effort level, and um, our response along the lines of anxious to calm and relaxing. So 
what we're going to do, and you don't have to follow this, you can just lead to me. What we're going to do is sit in that comfortable position. And you're going to track a couple of things. You're going to do some Saha breathing. And some of the things you've already done is track your nervous system, which means how if you're, if you're relaxing or moving towards anxiety when you do it. The effort, the opening of the diaphragm, where breath is it initiating from, which some of you said is lower down, Mark said lower down. And then open your mouth to breathe. Take a few breaths through your mouth. And watch what happens to effort, to where you breathe from. You could put your hand on your chest and on your belly to see the difference. And then go back and forth between nose and mouth until you really register how they affect you. All right, Jen, what'd you notice, Jen? Can I ask you? Um, sure. I felt like the uh, mouth breaths were shallower. Mm -hmm. Shallower meaning higher up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what did that do for your nervous system? Oh, I don't know. Well, you can try it again now. Yeah. It doesn't feel as relaxing. <coughs> Pardon me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Anybody else find the same thing or something different? Yeah. Mark, you found the same thing. Yeah. Suzanne. Yeah. It's a, the phenomenon is that um, when we breathe in through our, when we breathe in, our heart rate speeds up a little bit. And when we breathe out and an exhale, it slows down. And so that's a balancing of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. In other words, we get a little activated when we breathe in and a little relaxed when we breathe out. So that's a nat natural rhythm, a little bit of activation, a little bit of relaxation. When we use our mouth for breathing, we immediately move out of that relaxing and all into activation or fight or flight or mobilization for action. It would be the same response if a bear came through your door and you went, oh, you know, You'd be in total fight or flight. You'd have a, a rapid heart rate. You would um, be breathing a lot faster. You'd be breathing up here to move more air. You would get pale. Blood would move from the surface of your skin to protect you down to your organ body. You might sweat more. Digestion would be turned off. Your immune system would get overactive to protect you. And that's in the long run is not useful. So we want to really keep that rhythm of our nervous system balanced. And that's why I say talking is really important for me to pace myself and breathe through my nose when I run out of air. Because if I don't, then I'm going to start to get really activated in my talking and start to talk faster, being a little more nervous, being you know, a little more insecure. But here, I just follow the natural rhythm. And that what needs to be said needs to be said. I'm spending a few moments in my inhale with sa, so I feel the movement of my own body and breathing when I inhale. So I'm connecting to myself so that when I come back to talk to you, I'm more present to be with you because I've just spent a few moments with myself. And people who report listening to me speak this way find that they listening is a little bit more relaxed as well. To get a break from having to hear words just ongoingly without a break. So it's not easy to learn. It took me a while to learn it. And when, when I teach classes, I suggest to people to read aloud that periods and commas are a good place to think about taking a pause. 
And the really valuable part is to really finish that inhale where you feel satisfied, not grabbing for breath, but a real nice, easy inhale. Just takes a couple of seconds so that the next words out of your mouth are the new beginning. They're not rushed to fit into the old line that you were just trying to say, but each new start of talking is a new beginning. And the same thing is true with reading. I finish the sentence, take a breath, and it's a new sentence. And so with the newness each time, it has much more continuity. So I suggest practicing it, reading aloud. Okay. All right, so we said all that. And so here's, the, here's a little piece of science that's really important. And so over the oxygen supply of the body, carbon dioxide spreads its protective wings. So what that means, it comes from the Bohr effect, which was put into place as a scientific principle in 1904. And without too much science about it, carbon dioxide in the body regulates the distribution of oxygen from the blood to the cells, which is oxygen's final, final resting place, into the mitochondria to make the energy that the body runs on. All its metabolic activity is, metabolic activity is run on the adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, which is an energy molecule that is made from oxygen and carbohydrates and water. So when we overbreathe, when we breathe out too much from our mouth, and we follow the idea that in with the good, without with the bad, we actually reduce the flow of oxygen from our blood to our cells. So as long as our lungs are not hindered, especially by COVID, from oxygen distribution to the blood, we need to be really good at moving that oxygen from our blood, from the red blood cells, to our cells all the way out throughout the entire body. So this myth of deep breathing, where you take big breaths in and blow big breaths out, it may feel relaxing in your tissues for a moment, but what you've basically done is you've, in one breath, have decreased the amount of oxygen that's flowing off of the red blood cells by 2%. Three big breaths out to the mouth reduce the oxygen flow from the blood to the cells by 14%. So it's a really mind bender because mostly everybody thinks in the good without with the bad. And most everybody thinks we need more oxygen, but really we all breathe pretty well without having to take big breaths. But the issue is moving it from the blood to the cells and that is dependent upon carbon dioxide. So this is a good point for me to say that there are a lot of videos going around from doctors where they're doing a lot of big breaths, a lot of big breaths out to keep the lungs exercised. And that's a really, it's an okay idea if you wanna keep the lungs exercised, but you must, after you do that, close your mouth and breathe through your nose so you rebuild that carbon dioxide that you released in those exercises. That's the important part of the exercise that the, that the doctors are pushing out, out there, not pushing, but uh, are giving information about out there, especially the one from England where the doctor talks about I think it's called in Queen somewhere in England, where he's, he's demonstrating big breaths in and big breaths out and then coughing. And he even says it when he's on it, I'm getting dizzy. He's hyperventilating. And that's what happens when you hyperventilate. You lose oxygen to your brain and you get dizzy. One of the things that I think is fascinating, and I don't, can't say much about it, they're beginning to see that uh, COVID is acting more like high altitude uh, starvation of oxygen because people are coming in with very low saturation levels, 70 to 80, 80 saturation levels of blood, and they're not even short of breath because their, oxygen, because their carbon dioxide distribution is moving pretty easily. Even though their oxygen may not be moving easily, their carbon dioxide is being released, so they're not suffocating from carbon dioxide. So we're still learning about the disease. So just be careful of taking deep breaths and not following up with, you know, going back to your nose breathing and being quiet in your nose breathing. Okay. Robert, can I, ask I have you a please? quick question? Oh. Yeah, please, go ahead. Mark, go ahead. Or no, no, la ladies first, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. thank you. I have a question about that video. Um, I feel I'm recovering from, I'm waiting for COVID 
results back. But this last week I've had COVID like symptoms, which is why I was referred to this webinar. Um, and I did that exercise and I didn't like it. I found through the Saha and just the exercises we've done, I've been able to get more breath than I've been able to have in the last week. Great. Um, there, what part of that video, the second half of that exercise that he recommends that I like is laying on your stomach and doing some deep breaths. Can you talk about that and how that impacts what's happening in the lungs? Yeah, I wish he had said this. What happens when you lie on your stomach? And this was actually a Buteco, uh, spoke a lot about that, Dr. Buteco, who created the Buteco method in the 80s, that the best place to sleep, for people who, people, people over breathe, that's what he, especially asthmatics, breathe 20 to 30 times of breaths per minute. And people are always trying to get more air, take a deeper breath. And really what they're struggling with is really filling their lungs in a way that doesn't feel compromised. So lying on the stomach puts the weight of your body on the bed and on your chest, which keeps the lungs from overinflating. So it keeps the breath smaller and pushes more air to the back of the lungs. So that's a recovery from over breathing. Like he says, he almost gets dizzy, right? He's hyperventilated. He's reduced while he may be clearing his airways, he's reducing the amount of oxygen that flows to his brain. So that's why he's getting dizzy. So the recovery of that is to lie flat down, remove more air to the back because the lungs are compressed in the front, and to reduce the amount of breaths per minute and the volume per minute. So that's what he's after there. And that's why that works. Okay? But I find if I had COVID, I'd be doing Saha. Yeah, and I know some people who have, and that's what they did. Other people who work in the same field that I did are looking for more air in the back of their body because the front is where it feels really compressed. And like you just said, I can get more air back there. And that's what keeps the, that's what keeps the lungs working. I mean, they're now finding, and I don't know if this is a completely st true statistic, that 88% of the people who are intubated with ventilators don't survive. And the, and the, and the long-term coma that they put them in um, has, has cognitive and um, respiratory after effects. And from my viewpoint, I think when we take the body out of consciousness, um, it doesn't know how to fight for itself. So that's just my theory and my thought. Mark, you had a question? Yeah. Um, or a comment? I, I was curious about the... Um, this overactivation that happens when people are, are breathing so much through the mouth, um, is it uh, possible that, um, that this contributes to the age-related overactivation of the immune system that is seen so often now? And I, I'm also aware of the fact that there's a, um, an autoimmune component to COVID um, in, in the lungs um, that, that is partially uh, uh, accounting for the overreaction that, that causes the extreme um, immune reaction in the lungs. Um, so I'm just curious if you could uh, talk about that for a moment. Well, there are two things I want to say about it. One was that Hans Staley in the 1930s, he's the man who created the word stress, distress, eustress, yeah. and something called the general adaptation syndrome. And so what he basically said there was when we're stressed all the time and when we're um, over overacting our immune system, and I'll say why that happens, that we'll see over time complete organ failure through in throughout the body, and especially in the places that are weakest. So let's now to go back to pollution. We are all weakened in our lungs. I mean, I just don't think you can get away from it, really. It's just, there's a wonderful new book out called Choked, um, Air Pollution and Breath, which really does the research on that. The other thing that we do know is that when, when you are in fight or flight, one of the functions besides is that the, um, the body shuts off non-essential systems. Like one of the things that it shuts off is digestion. It's really hard to eat and digest when you're feeling really stressed, right? We know that digestion is turned off. What happens with the immune system and the immune system says, okay, we need to get rid of what's non-essential in our body right now so that we're more flexible to fight the threat. So it goes after what feels like it's far into the body. Continual activation into fight or flight, the immune system loses track of what's friendly and what's foreign. And so it begins to destroy healthy tissue. 
when, especially in the lungs, when it begins to destroy healthy tissue, that healthy tissue becomes debris. Mm. And that debris is what begins to block up the passageways of movement and the permeability of movement of air from the lungs to the blood. There's wow. too much sludge to get through and the oxygen can't move through. That's my understanding. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so, in, so the general adaptation syndrome means when you're stressed like that all the time, a couple of things I want to say about it is that the oxygen flow because of the stress and the overbreathing that accompanies that and the anxiety up here reduces the balance of carbon dioxide in your body. So there's not as much oxygen moving to the cells. So the cells are working anaerobically, not producing as much energy. So their body's fatigued. And generally speaking, the organ body that is in us is the weakest was going to be suffering the first because it's going to receive less air um, and, less, and less oxygen supply. Um, and our immune systems right now are really challenged because besides the pollution, we're all dealing with microplastics at this particular time. So our immune system is having a really hard time sorting out what's foreign and what's real for us because of the plastics in our system. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do one last uh, question. Um, is there a relationship between the, what's happening in terms of the stress syndrome um, affecting the lungs and the, the microbiome, the, the, um, the microbiome of the body all of, because you know, it's, it's fascinating to look at um, autoimmune diseases right now. There's a lot of evidence that hidden infections um, and, you know, bacterial imbalances throughout the body um, and viral uh, infections that are silent uh, are, are feeding into the autoimmune issue. Um, I just wondered if, if, if there's a relationship that you see between the lungs and the gut um, that, that has this... Uh, yeah, well, the lungs, the lungs and the gut tissue are the same. Oh, okay. Um, so that 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 makes sense. And um, I'm trying to keep a lot of thoughts in my head. When the when let me say this because there's a thought I had earlier. When our body does not receive the amount of oxygen it's meant to be receiving because of an imbalance in the blood gases or too much over breathing, the cells are in starvation for oxygen, primary nutrient before water and before food. When the cells themselves are at the level of starvation, any stress coming into the body is going to be harder for the body to manage, whether it's a mental stress, an emotional stress, or a viral stress, or a bacterial stress. In terms of the biome, I know that Dr. Bertica was a really big advocate about checking people's teeth when they had asthma or when they had trouble breathing because he found that a lot of teeth infections from root canal and other ways of um, tooth, teeth not being healthy had a huge effect on breathing. So I would expect the same thing to be true about the microbiome in the gut as well. Any, any small, he even used to say that if you have a hangnail and it's bothering you, it's going to affect your breathing because your breathing is always adjusting to the metabolic activity of what's going on in your body. So the healthier it is, the healthier the breathing is going to be in response to that. Okay, thanks for the question, Mark. And I did, did, who did I read? Oh, was it Charles Eisenstein or Eisenstein? Or somebody was talking about, I think it was him talking about the viome. Now we're having a different conversation. There's a biome and a viome that are, we are all contained with viruses in our body all the time. And what causes one to get more active than another one? That's the good question. Why one comes, comes more forward than another one? You know, there's a lot going on around the biome is not, it's not a living organism. My question is, does it have consciousness? Uh, maybe. Now that we know that atoms have consciousness, that's been, that's been verified. So you can't separate one nature from another nature. It's all part of one, one big cycle. Don't want to get too esoteric out here. All right, nose clearing exercises. What happens if you have a stuffed nose? Well, this is a way to clear your stuffed nose. Remember, the more you mouth breathe, the more your nose is going to stuff up. That's just a natural response of the nose to do that. So this is really simple. You'll read this on your own. Basically, what you're doing is you're learning how to, first, first thing you do is you breathe in when you, when, you, when you raise your head. You breathe out. You breathe in. You breathe out. 
You have to walk clean hands, washed hands, you pinch the bottom of your nose, and you bob your head anywhere from three to six to 10 times, depending on your neck and your heart condition, keeping your mouth closed and breathing in as if you're smelling a rose. So with a Saha breath, as gentle a stream as you can find. And you can repeat that as often as you need to until your nose clears up. If your neck is compromised, then you can move your feet around or you can walk them back and forth across the room. And you wanna do that as frequently as you can until your nose clears up. So I, I, tell, I tell this story about coming home from Sweden after teaching there and I caught a cold there and I was on the plane and my nose was really stuffed. And I did this every five minutes for 12 hours. People thought I was crazy, but I kept breathing through my nose. I was a brand new Buteco teacher. So I was, I'm nose breathing the whole way. And um, it worked, kept my nose clean. Um, so just, you know, repeat it as often as you need to. It really works. Anybody who did it there feel a little more opening just for a moment. So the, the big caveat here is if you have a compromise in your lungs or you have a COVID or you have heart condition or any other compromising condition, then really don't hold the breath too long. You wanna just maybe do three to six times. If you're perfectly healthy, you wanna do it until you feel a slight urge to breathe so that when you let go, you can breathe really gently. If you have to breathe like this, you've held your breath too long. So that's why I use the analogy to feel like you're smelling a rose, because roses have very subtle and delicate odors, right? So you want to catch a whiff of that. So really gentle, really gentle, a gentle breeze through your nose. Okay, questions? All sound good? Catherine, unmute. You got you go. it? Yeah, you got it. I'm not sure I understand this. So um, it says breathe smoothly, gently, and quietly. But I mean, if you're going to, you would be breathing through your mouth because you're holding your nose. No, no. Good. Thanks for the question. So you breathe. Everything I teach is always at the end of the exhale. So I breathe in, I breathe out, then I hold. My mouth is closed. That makes sense now? Yeah, so you, when, you, when it says breathe in as your head goes back, breathe out as your head goes forward, that means after you let go. No, that's how to set it up for this. So you breathe oh, okay. in, okay. breathe out. So you're in that rhythm. It's just a way to get in that okay. rhythm. Okay. I often don't do that part of it, but it's a way to teach it. Okay, so I, when I'm doing this and I, and I come back to, it's like, it's intoxicating. That, that wave of breath is like, just it, for me, it feels intoxicating because it's so pleasurable. It kind of, I get the breeze through. It's like, you know, being outside and having the wind blow through the leaves and come through my face. And it's like Sabine said, no difference between inside out. I'm just a leaf being stirred in the wind. Because if I go to a bulk like this, my nose is going to stuff up because the nose is the nose is going to be the nose is the guardian of the lungs. It's going to collapse a little bit and not allow such a huge volume to come through it too fast. Okay. Any other questions? Robert. Yep. Sabine, Sabine is asking if if uh, you could comment on how breathing uh, relates to insomnia. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> insomnia needs a sleep sleep needs good oxygen supply and you know balanced co2 levels in the body when the body's rhythm is hyperventilating or breathing too fast it's imperative to slow it down and to relax the breathing and then the body can go to sleep it's a signal that's just too much activity okay thank you yeah so this is information that's been coming through from other breathing teachers. I give you the reference point through it here and also a, um, a link to the Society of Microbiology. 
that nose breathing and humming, speaking of insomnia for 20 minutes, produces nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vaso and bronchial dilator, as is carbon dioxide, which is why this works. And it can increase the, can increase the production in your nose up seven to 15 times. And nitric oxide, being, both being a vaso and bronchial dilator and having the airways get open, has also shown, and they did the studies after SARS in 2003 and 2006, that it had antiviral effects in keeping inflammation down from the viruses. Don't know that that's true with COVID, but it's worth a try. So 20 minutes or even longer, just a hum. You just hum anything you wanna be humming, right? Big piece about humming is to making sure so that you get the full effect of the carbon of the nitric oxide that's getting produced is when you mm, the tendency would be to go, you know, take a next breath, but you're humming, mm, pacing that hum until you feel like you're out of air, then you close your mouth. Take that nice breath back in quietly and then mm, So making sure you're pacing yourself so you can continue to breathe through your nose the whole time. So there's no, and part of what that does also from a, from a, a different kind of exploration is that it de-densifies the tissue from the humming. So it makes the whole head a little bit more permeable for breath. And it gives you some more sensory information about the whole breathing apparatus because the hum is gonna vibrate in areas. You're gonna feel more of yourself. So let's just do this for a minute together. All right, just one minute of humming. See how you feel with it. Okay, just a minute so we can keep moving along. Does it feel okay to everybody? Mark, did you want to say something? No, you liked it though. Yeah, I knew that's some two marks on it, two marks. <laughs> but it's okay, we can get acknowledgement from both of them. Yeah, it really feels like it deepens my voice, it deepens my respiration, opens me up a whole lot. So really worthwhile thing to do. One study showed some uh, uh, um, uh, people with sinus infections did an hour of humming before, before going to bed at night. And um, in four days, the complete sinus infection was gone. Okay. This is a stop cough exercise. Probably you cannot do this with COVID. COVID, the cough I hear is pretty intense. But you just want to take small breaths in through your nose, hold for a few seconds, which we'll go over in a minute and see if you can breathe in and out slowly through your nose. Psychologically tell yourself you're not gonna cough. And this is for a regular cough if you cough coughing too much. But COVID, the cough is pretty intense from what I understand. This is a really important exercise. One of the, one of the most um, profound exercises that I think I learned in Buteco, really simple to do. It's called the mini pause. So even if you're doing that thing that the doctor recommends and over breathing for a minute, you can do this afterwards. A mini pause means breathing in for about two or three seconds and breathing out for about three or four seconds and suspending your breathing for three to five seconds. So you breathe in, you breathe out, suspend for three to five seconds. 
and you breathe in again. A couple of things happen for me. One is it increases my CO2 on the suspension. And it also brings my energy back down. So it says here about coughing, sneezing, yawning, and sighing. All of those activities are very up energy, brings you up. If you do them repeatedly over and over again, your breathing habit starts to come up into the chest. The mini pause brings you back down to the diaphragm. And in a couple of lectures ago, uh, one of my friends and students reminded me that I, when I teach this, I teach about if you're feeling well, well, if you have a sore throat, something's not feeling just right in you, to do 100 of them in an hour is a way of really boosting your immune system. You're spending a lot of time in the suspension of breathing, a lot of time of building a little bit of CO2 reserve, getting a little more oxygen, and so your immune system is getting a little stronger to help fight whatever there is. If you're feeling really not well at all, do them three times in a day. So there are two ways that I do this. One is get 100 toothpicks, put them on the left side or the right side, your preference, and every time you do one, move a toothpick over to the other side until you finish the 100. I like to do, I don't like to mess with the toothpicks, so I just breathe one, two normal breaths, and then a mini pause. One, two normal breaths, and then a mini pause. And in about an hour, it takes, I get 100 of them done. So I just time it for an hour and just do them for that hour. So any coughing, anything that happens after the coughing, even if it's COVID, if you've been coughing a lot, every time you get a chance, do some mini pauses afterwards when you get some respite. It's a good little exercise to do. Very helpful. Yeah, Catherine. So, okay, so say again, like how many breaths you would take before a mini pause? So if I've um, coughed, I do it right after a mini pause. Or if I sneezed or I yawned, I do it right after. Uh-huh. But if I was practicing it to not feel well, to feel better if not feeling well, I would do a breath, I would do a mini pause, breathe in, breathe out, hold for three to five seconds. Okay. And I would do two normal breaths. Okay. And then I do the mini pause. Okay. That would get me a hundred in an hour. So breath holding really makes a difference in health. The more and more of that is getting um, recognized. Mateko really recognized this early in his career and it's being more, much more accepted now. Robert. Suzanne. When you say breath holding, you're talking about after the exhale. Always after the exhale. Always. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Originally, when Dr. Pateko created this for asthmatics, um, specifically at that time, asthmatics tend to be hyperinflated already from not being able to release um, their CO2 in there. And so we didn't want to overinflate them anymore. So it came at the end of the exhale. It's, it's a better judge of um, health at the end of the exhale. Um, okay, wait. so here's a picture that I spoke to earlier. Here's the man's nose again, and this is the way the air moves in the lungs. It moves in spirals. No straight line with breath. That's why when I say breathing in with saha and breathing quietly, I'm attending to all of that spiral movement. It's not a linear phenomenon, but when we breathe quickly, it becomes really linear. So slowing it down tunes us into the more um, geometric a pattern of spirals, which is what moves our body. So if we allow ourselves not to sit totally still when we're breathing, we can feel how breath just rocks us a little bit. And that rocking is really comforting as well. So in its rocking movement, breath provides some comfort in that way as well. So this is a really old picture here. Of course, it's got smoke in it, so but nonetheless. So here's the important information. The nose is the guardian of the lungs. The nose filters particles 0.5 microns and above. The human hair is 50 microns, which mostly means that most particulate matter, which is 2.5 microns and below, does get filtered by the nose if you keep your mouth closed. 
Viruses in smoke are below 0.5 microns. That's why the masks are rec being recommended. Masks will do 0.3 microns. So the nose can't handle the virus or the smoke, but it does give the body an opportunity to present the virus to the immune system before it goes right into the lungs directly. The nose regulates the temperature of the air. Body temperature air is what the lungs like. So the nose has a great ability to use the blood in the nose to either heat or cool the air. It presents the air to the lungs at the right humidity through the mucous membranes by either putting moisture into the lungs or taking into the air or taking moisture out of the air. And most importantly, it produces antibacterial molecules, which is what is really important even in fighting viruses, even though they're antibacterial molecules. And it helps regulate gas exchange and nitric oxide production. And it gives the body a chance to recognize the virus. So they're, they're on your slide, there'll be a list at the end with 28 other reasons to breathe through your nose. So take time to read that if you will. So again, we're su supporting the ideas we said earlier, oxygen delivers oxygen to the cells, providing nourishment for energy production, supports all immune system functioning, and self-regulation of the autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic and sympathetic. So breathing, we have to recognize breathing is a habit. We all have habits of the way we breathe that we learned over time, probably mostly unconsciously, from you know, things that we found pleasurable, things that we found traumatic, it starts to pattern our breathing. So we have to understand our pattern of habits of breathing. And here, the one habit that we really want to pay attention to is when we use our mouths for breathing. So to change a habit, it takes about six to eight weeks to change a habit, but you have to know you're doing that habit. Right? So you want to make a list. When do you notice you're using your mouth for breathing? And so when you see, you see those things on the list, when you go to do those things later on, you go, wait a minute. This is where I usually use my mouth for breathing. So you can make a conscious choice in that moment to say, no, I'm not going to use my mouth for breathing this time. I'm going to use my nose for breathing. Common places are talking, taking a shower, driving a car, watching television, eating, drinking, and you'll find your own. But I really recommend just keeping this basic list. My, one of two places that I speak about was when I opened my car door after driving, I'd open my mouth to breathe. No idea why that happened, but I've stopped that habit. The other one was going to the mailbox and mailboxes caused a lot of anxiety and I'm not the only one. It's a common complaint. So I, as soon as I started to go to the door, I go time to pick up the mail, close my mouth, breathe through my nose and go walk to the mailbox and back. Turns out the mailbox is not that scary after all. <laughs> but you know, I hate that feeling of moving up into here. You know, it's right away. It's like, as soon as you move up into here to breathe, you're going to go, what's wrong with my life? What's wrong with me? And try to figure out everything that you can do to have not to have that anxiety feeling. And the gift is just move the breath down to the belly. And that soothes that whole anxiety, it does for me anyway. Because really, right in this moment, I'm walking, I'm alive. So let's try another meditation right now, another breathing, another few minute breathing meditation. And this one is also something that's our inherent in breath. It's nothing more that you have to do but following the breath. And the gift of breath is that it's in relationship to gravity, to the force of gravity, and to the support of the earth. The earth holds us. We don't go through the earth. We don't lift up off it. We land on it. So every exhale, as we let the air out, we have less buoyancy in our lungs, we get a little bit, not necessarily heavier, but we feel the weight of ourselves with more consciousness. So while we're exhaling, we can let, allow ourselves to let the weight of ourselves move downwards towards the earth. And the chair, or the floor, whatever you're sitting on, is actually waiting for your weight to land on it. And the more conscious you get of that, the more you recognize you're resting on the support that's underneath you. 
not unlike a dog or a cat who's lying on the floor. You can come by and pick them up with a shovel. They just release all their weight to, look to being supported. So just keep trying that. And when you breathe in, I said breath follows awareness. So be aware of the support. And as you breathe in, notice you get more buoyant. And you can use sa and ha here. And each time you come down to rest on the support, you may notice that there's some little small incremental release of tension somewhere. And it could be in your legs, could be in your feet, could be in your shoulders, could be in your eyes. Just notice that you're actually letting them soften to be supported. And when you do that, on the next inhale, be real careful and sure that you see what kind of effect letting some tension go has on the ease of the exhale, inhale in the sense of buoyancy. Buoyancy is related to space and the upward force of gravity. And the downward pull is the downward force of gravity. Both things are at play in the breath. Exhale is the downward pull, and the inhale is the upward lift. And this exercise begins to teach us how we hold our tensions and where we see. The more we practice, usually the same places let go. So we get good and releasing tension quicker, which frees up the breath. So it's really learn, using the breath to learn how to rest yourself. And so if you're lying down, more of you would be supported by gravity, more surface area. So if you're noticing any other sensations other than gravity, just bring them into your awareness and breathe with other sensations. Whatever sensations are arising at the end of your exhale, just breathe with them. Even if it's, a, if you're, it's your heart that you're noticing beating, breathe with the awareness of your heart. Anything that increases your ability to tune into your own biology. Yeah, and movement is fine. If you feel your body wanting to move and sway or stretch or in a particular way, you can allow that. And then come back to quiet breathing and see how that movement may have helped you soften and make more space. So we're coming to the end of our time. These are things you can come back to on your own. And it's just dipping your toe in the water here. So I suggest that you practice this so you get good at it. And so you feel your nature of your breathing and become more intimate with the experience for five or 10 minutes at a time so that you get in about 60 minutes a day. The more you do, 60 minutes is enough. 
the more familiar you are with the process and how to return to a state that feels like it satisfies you. So that you get a sense of what's the difference between when you're anxious and when you're not. So you can begin to see that there is a choice involved. And there's that little line at the bottom that talks about taping your mouth at night. This is paper tape, hypoallergenic paper tape. And you tear a piece off, you immediately bend a piece that's not sticky, clean hands. You take a little bit of the sticky off and you can wear this one of four ways. You can wear it this way in a smaller piece. You can wear it this way and then another piece. But really basically, So it's a great way to break the nighttime habit of breathing through your mouth. If you wake up in the morning and you feel not rested, the mouth is really dry. If you follow what I said earlier, that mouth breathing triggers a sympathetic response. You've been breathing in a little bit of anxiety all night long. You want to cut it out. If, you don't, if it looks scary to you, try it during the day while you're reading, while you're washing the dishes, while you're taking a walk. It helps break the habit of mouth breathing. Okay, I like to tell the story uh, that I got from Ramdas, I believe, in one of his books about an Aikido master who's 92 years old, and he always beats all his students. And they then they the students get together and say, "Okay, we'll wait for him in the bathroom because he gets up in the middle of the night to pee, and we'll just jump him when he gets up in the middle of the night." So they get up in the middle of the night, waiting for him. He goes to the urinal. They're up there, and they jump him, and he beats them all immediately. So the parable goes, the students say, Master, Master, how is it you get on, how is it you're on center all the time? And he says, I'm not on center all the time. I just know how to get there really quickly. So that's the story here. How do I get and return to my breathing that soothes me, relaxes me, and balances me? The more I practice, the more I know how to get there really quickly. One breath will bring you back. One breath will balance your nervous system. One breath will balance your blood gases. So you want to get good at it. All right. So we talked about extended period of anxiety and what it does to the body, but here's some notes on that. And this is the last piece. This is a this is an exercise. If you are getting, if you no matter what happens, you can't seem to slow your breathing down. And so this exercise is designed one for anxiety and one for people who have asthma. And so the instructions are you breathe in for two seconds, out for three seconds, and suspend. It's like a mini pause. And you build a sequence, two in, three out, hold for three. Two in, three out, hold for four, hold for five, hold for six. When you get to six, go back to five, to four, to three, to two. If you're trying to interfere with an asthma attack and you don't have your inhaler, you go past six, you go to seven, to eight, to nine, to 10, and then back. If you can't get that high, that's okay. Just stop where you feel like you can't, you, you, you're not going to be forced to open your mouth to breathe and go back from there and do it again. So I've stopped many panic attacks just with this first one. So some people tell me this isn't clear, but you can take a look at it and see if it feels clear to you. If you're bare with me, we can do it. It only takes 81 seconds. You guys willing to do this together? Yes, yes, no, no. Okay, great. Let's just do this together. Follow my instructions. I will say, breathe in, breathe out, and suspend, okay? We'll just do it up to six. Let's see how you feel. It may feel fast to you because you're already pretty relaxed. Because remember, this is done when you're already feeling like you're too pent up. So take a breath in, out, suspend. One, two, in, out, Suspend, one, two, three. Breathe in, out, suspend. One, two, three, four. Breathe in, out, suspend. One, two, three, four, five. In, out, suspend. One, two, three, 
four, five, six. In, out, suspend. One, two, three, four, five. In, out, suspend. One, two, three, four. In, out, suspend. One, two, three. In, out, suspend. One, two. In, and out. Okay, that's pretty clear, yeah? Feel okay? Great. Okay, let me see what else here before we go. So here's one from Botego, if you're not feeling well. Um, sea salt, quarter of a teaspoon to half a teaspoon of sea salt, not iodized salt, dissolved in a cup of hot water. Drink it two or three times. It's the minerals that'll really support your health from sea salt. It really works. It's amazing, especially for breathing. And um, if you want, Wash your nose, wash your hands, wash your nose. A little bit of salt in your hands or in a neti pot. Take all that debris that you may have picked up outside, especially the air pollution, wash it out. Get your nose clean again, get, get it off your cilia. It's as simple as throw it up in your face. Just get some of that out of your nose. And um, I think I wanted to say this earlier. Uh, this is from Stephen Porges. You can click on that YouTube link. He just talks about social distancing and the importance of um, making eye contact. So that even with your friends, don't text, don't email, but write, but do FaceTime, do Zoom, do something so you're actually seeing each other. And he's also recontextualized fight and flight and freeze, which I really like that when we're in fight and flight, it is mobilizing energy. And so you have to recognize, can I use that energy for something that I need to right now? Or is it really out of sync with myself? And freezing is a time for rest. And so you might think of it that way and not pathologize that it's something wrong with me, but maybe it's just a time for rest. And, um, you know, I think you all know about masks now. There's enough information about masks out there, but I think everybody should have an air filter in their house, one that has charcoal as well as HEPA filter. And there's conversation out there that there are filters that have silver in them, which is good for killing viruses. But, and if there's smoke outside, if it's getting ready for smoke season, don't cook in the house if you can't open your windows because it's huge. I cooked some um, bacon this morning in an air fryer. The air pollution in the house went to 540. F 50, below 50 is normal. And this was in the other room. So it's, it's just amazing how much cooking pollutes the air. So open your windows. If you can't open them, don't cook in the house. So I have an air monitor that I use. So um, this is me. I do private work. I do semi-private classes. And I also do some work on telehealth with an organization called Holistic Orthopedics, an insurance pays for education. So if you're more interested more in taking more Boteco classes and learning the entire method, you can get it paid for by insurance now. So on your slides, I have some resources. I have some YouTubes um, that I really like. There's some um, physical exercises, one from Postural Restoration Institute on how to open the lungs. Another one from um, some, uh, some Qigong. This is a filter and then a whole list of nose breathing reasons and then some information on nitric oxide and then some of the movement exercises are also there. I'd give you a reference point if you wanted to see some of those. And of course, I'm a continuum teacher, so there's a lot of continuum uh, being offered right now, which I find to be the most effective way of um, soothing the body and opening up into the body's intelligence. Right, Suzanne? Absolutely. Right, right Shana? <laughs> mm -hmm. So any last minute questions, any thoughts, anything else you might want to know that I can give answers to? If I want to share this, Robert, with someone that wasn't on the call, can I just send you 15 bucks and forward yeah. it to them? Yeah, you can. I'll be sending out a little later, maybe an hour or two. 
You no longer have a client. Um, all the links, it'll be on YouTube uh, for people who have the link and it'll also be on the Google Drive and I'll send you an email with all of that and the slides will be included on the, in the email to be attached, sure. And if people can't afford the $15 and you think it's useful, send it to them anyway. Thank you for your generosity. This was really helpful. Good. I have a question for you, Robert. Yeah. How about breathing during strenuous exercise, aerobic exercise, bike yeah. riding, hill climbing? Yeah, I'll go back to this image here, um, Fred. Of this woman here on your left, running a quarter mile, fastest woman in the world of a quarter mile. And she didn't open her mouth. So it's keeping the, the tongue back on the ridges and up against the palate. Yeah, the most important part about this is breath consciousness, feeling your body moving with breath. And when you feel your body moving with breath, you move at the pace that you can breathe in the capacity that you feel in your lungs and coordinate those two and you'll be, begin to be able to exercise and keep your nose breathing. And what you do basically is you start off when you feel like you have to open your mouth to breathe, either stop and do one of these exercises or just slow down, get your nose breathing back in order, then pick up the pace again. And over time, not many days, you'll start to know, oh, I'm going longer with just breathing through my nose. So pace yourself so you can breathe that way and you'll find your endurance will pick up. Okay, great. Yeah. Especially, you know, you're in Vashon. If, you're, if you bicycle anywhere near the, in town in the morning, in the evening, the air's pretty polluted here in town. Um, because of the diesel trucks coming in to give us our food. So you have to be careful in the middle of town here. Yeah, I'm mostly thinking about all the hills on the periphery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, um, the exercise we just did with in for two, out for three, you can do that when you're, uh, when you're riding. Slow down and just practice that. You'll gain your breath back and you'll be control around the hills. And if you have to open your mouth, you open your mouth. And then when you get to the top of the hill and you're on the next incline, just close your mouth again and go back to nose breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Suzanne. I'm very grateful to go over all this and I really appreciate the reminder of the hyperventilation exercise, mm -hmm. number one and two, because I use that to get back to sleep at night. If I wake up and I start getting overactivated mm -hmm. and I'm so, it works so well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I use that one also all the time if I wake up in the middle of the night. It's like counting sheep for one. So it takes your mind off it, but there really is a physiological benefit of um, moving more oxygen and then helping the system relax a little bit. All right. We're still here. So if there are any, thank you, Shana. Thank you, Suzanne. Everybody, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Nice to see thank you. you. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, you're welcome. They're When's right the here. next one? Next Sunday, same time. Okay. The flower will go out during the week. As long All as right. people keep coming, I'll keep doing them. So you're going to put Very it out? Very helpful. Now. When's the flower coming out this week? I'll, I just sent it in. I'll probably the first one will come out on Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Bye. Great to see you. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Here I am in full view again. Mwah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, was it? I'm going to go in. Okay. Just looking at the, the um, chats. Okay. All right. Oh, sea salt is full of microplastics. Yeah. Pink Himalayan and sea salt. Great. Okay. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> Adios. Bye now. Bye.